Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh, and our guests are the superintendent of schools in Tucson, Arizona, John Hupenthal, as well as Richard Martinez. Uh, superintendent Hupenthal has just suspended the Mexican American Studies program. Richard Martinez represents the students and teachers of that program. Richard Martinez, you said studies indicate uh, that the students do better, uh, have a higher graduation rate out of the Mexican American Studies program. What evidence do you have of that? What studies have been done? Well, the, the program has been audited, and there has been statistical analysis done of the students who have attended the program over its 10-year uh, history. And each year, we have found that when we compare the students who attended the classes to the Latino students who were not in Mexican American Studies and compared them to their, their cohorts, that the MAS students always did better. You know, that's a consistent finding. And what we found that unlike any other program, uh, this, the district's own analysis, that of, uh, of other professors uh, from the University of Arizona found that this program more effectively closed the achievement gap for Latino students in Tucson Unified School District than any other program that exists there. This is the only program that has had that success. And Tucson Unified School District, in fact, the entire state of Arizona, has essentially a 50 percent dropout rate for Latino students. Mr. Hoopenthal, while he's been in public office, has overseen one of the most dismal educational systems for Latino students in the history of the country. You know, our students just don't do well. And, and it, during his tenure, he has also been a promoter of, of vouchers that have allowed essentially charter schools to exist, which has it's essentially created an entirely segregated public school system. In TUSD, Latinos are now 62 percent of the student body, and within five years will represent 70 percent of that student body. What we have to have is an educational system that understands and recognizes the need to educate successfully Latino students to get them to high, to, through high school, have them graduate, and have them go on to college. He has no program that addresses the needs of Latino students. He's trying to impose upon Latino students extraordinary measures that no other group has to do. No, no one goes out to the community to have their curriculum approved. No one is subject to the white majorities, as Mr. Hoopenthal w would suggest, that we have to have their approval for a curriculum that works. In fact, he's ignoring the Cambian Audit Report, which also confirmed all the statistical analysis about the success of this program, the success of the students, found that students who are not Latino who attended these classes not only enjoyed the same benefits of the classes, but that their, their, their viewpoints were extremely broadened. His suggestion well, if, that this if is a we narrow might, curriculum let's, let's take these that limits issues. Latinos. Let's take these to, issues to one at a time. A, a so, center, uh, ethnocentric perspective, it's just completely false. And in fact, it is his ethnocentric perspective that has led to the demise of this program, at least for the moment. Uh, Superintendent Hoopenthal, your response. Well, let's take the issues one at a time. Let's start with the, with the Cambium audit. When we analyzed what went on in the Cambium audit, we realized that they allowed one of the creators of the Mexican-American studies to control the audit structure. And that's, you know, anybody who's familiar with auditing processes, that's not just, just not permissible. But even having said that, though, what happened with the audit was revealing. So the, the founder of the Mexican-Americans, the designer of the Mexican-American Studies cl uh, classes was able to control when the auditors went into the class and which classes they went into. And when we compared what happened when the auditors were present looking, uh, watching, observing, and we compare that with thousands of pages of lesson plans, you could see that the teachers themselves knew what was inappropriate. The inappropriate behavior disappeared when they were being observed. So when you compare the lesson plans of actually delivered Mexican-American studies that was replete with inappropriate um, um, teacher behavior, and w w compared with what, was, what happened when, it w when they were being audited, there was a difference. But that's what you would expect. People don't do inappropriate things while they're being watched. So this was all carefully detailed. We had to, when we went to the judge, this was all laid out, and the judge was able to fully take into account the audit circumstances. 
The other issue has to do with the effectiveness of Mexican-American studies academically. And the, the claims of success, academic success, for Mexican-American studies were done by comparing an apple to an orange. When you very carefully compare graduation rates of seniors to seniors and cohort to cohort, the so-called uh, academic advantages and benefits of Mexican-American studies disappeared. We could find no statistical difference between them and their peers. The, um, but regardless of, of those issues, the suggestion that a school board shouldn't be in control of its classes, that a prison principal shouldn't be in control of their school, these things we find to be intolerable. The, this education system has to be accountable to the community. It has to, the community has to be able to come, out, come forward and say, what are you teaching our students in these classes? And we have to be proud of what we're teaching. That doesn't mean that we, we rinse the controversy out of it. We can take on very controversial subjects, and we should have all vantage points, in particular the ones that uh, the good lawyer is talking about. So this is not uh, talking about ethnocentricity. Th this is talking about healthy educational processes that allow students to think critically from m many viewpoints, not be in indoctrinated into a Palofarian, Marxian kind of style of thinking about racial attitudes and 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 creating hatred and and uh, creating an attitude of of really that's unhealthy in our educational system and one that if it was subject to community review wouldn't be allowed Richard Martinez by regardless of where you are in the political spectrum Richard Martinez well, first, first of all through this process the, the, Mr. Hoopenthal has never produced any statistical analysis which shows other than the success of the program his own auditors confirmed those numbers Number two, his suggestion that we controlled or somehow in Tucson what the auditor saw was controlled or fixed is just a false uh, accusation. More important, Mr. Hoopenthal ignores that he cannot, nor has he ever defined what it is that a teacher says or does that promotes resentment, is a curriculum designed primarily for students of a particular ethnic group, or that that advocates ethnic solidarity. Those are terms that he can't define. In the absence of being able to define them for the average person to know, for the average educator to know, classroom teacher to be able to understand what are the bright lines between what I can and cannot do, they have, they have a law that fundamentally is flawed. It's, a, it's an unconstitutional statute. It's void for vagueness. And, and it's something that is currently subject to uh, the scrutiny uh, of a federal judge. You know, that process will play itself out, but in the meantime, what Mr. Hoopenthal has done is placed over 800 students who are in these classes and, 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 and enjoying the benefits of these classes from having any class at all. He has interfered with a number of high school students' education in a, man, in a manner that is just incomprehensible. He has come into Tucson from Phoenix as a state elected official and done violence upon our community by imposing his personal will, by blackmailing this community with saying that I will take away $14 million of your funding if you don't cease these programs immediately, because he was able to pass a law that gave him that authority. And, and that's what's being challenged. And what, what has occurred here is that he's taken away from our entire community a curriculum that was adopted by our school board, that was developed by our school district and that have successfully operated for well over 10 years. You know, he's imposing his viewpoint as the one that must be accepted in Tucson, Arizona, and he calls us dysfunctional. What we have here is an abuse of power and an abuse of a viewpoint from a single person who represents a, you know, right-wing Republican agenda in Arizona. And, uh, and, and it's just part of the same kind of tactics that have been employed in Arizona by, reflected by 1070, you know, the anti-immigrant perspective. It is, you know, the anti-Latino perspective that exists in the state. And they're taking away the most successful program that has existed in, in, in the state of Arizona. 
Uh, let me got, ask Superintendent Hoopenthal yeah. uh, about the well, issue of the higher graduation rates of students coming out of uh, the Mexican American Studies program. Well, when you're doing those kind of analysis, you have to be very careful to compare apples to apples, oranges to oranges when you're comparing cohorts. So, for example, when you're comparing graduation rates, if you are looking at the effect of some program on seniors, you have to compare seniors to seniors. If you compare seniors to eighth graders, seniors naturally have huge graduation rates. Eighth graders have much lower graduation rates. You, those kind of careful statistical cohort analysis are very careful. When we subjected Mexican-American studies to very careful, rigorous analysis, the um, we could not find any statistical significance to any claim of higher graduation rates. Let me ask so you. Let me ask one other issue. question. Then. I mean, let me, because I we mean, don't have much I time. Mean, but I wanted to ask you a question okay. that might go to a bigger issues, a, a broader agenda that you have laid out. Um, mm -hmm. Last uh, fall, you aired a controversial radio ad um, that said you would stop La Raza. What does that mean? Well. The let's talk about what I did when I got into office. First, my predecessor had made a determination about the classes. I set that aside. So they had in the, the claim that the school board has adopted the Mexican American Studies curriculum is an incorrect claim. The Mexican the, the school board has not done what it's required to do. They need to adopt a curriculum for that class. Ooh, and I'm somebody who's obsessed with local control. So I set aside my predecessor's determination, and I gave them all that semester to get their house in order, to get their curriculum adopted, to get their lesson plans. But if you could just answer up, that question, that they were because it goes to a more overarching issue, um, running a campaign ad that said you will stop La Raza, what does that mean? Well, La Raza became symbolic for all of these classes and the, uh, the, pro the problems with them, that we would get this controversy under control and resolve it. That's what that, that's what that claim means. La Raza was, a, was shorthand for all of the controversy associated with these classes. And Richard Martinez, what does La Raza mean to you? La, la, la raza means is it's used in, in, uh, among Latinos or Spanish speakers. It just re refers to the people. Um, and, and well, it, it, it literally it, it is a word that means no race. Mr. Hoopenthal racialized the term and, and, and ran an anti-Latino campaign to get himself elected to public office in this state. It was his first time attempting a statewide campaign, and he did the exact same thing that Tom Horn did, which is they decided to run on the, on the anti-immigrant, the anti-Latino agenda, and get themselves into office. And that's exactly what he did. He also makes reference to using statistics or that this is a controversy in Tucson. First of all, no one in Tucson was complaining about this curriculum. Number two, only Phoenix complained about it, and it was Republicans who complained about it. And, and their complaint about it was that students were looking at the way in which Latinos were being treated and thinking about it critically and, and asking fundamental questions. Richard Martinez, sorry, uh, we don't have much time, and I just wanted to, to, to uh, get you to try to explain why those seven books were selected, the books that have been banned from classrooms. Are you asking well, me? Or Mr. Yes, I'm, uh, Richard Martinez. The books, me, the books me, that have been banned actually are much issue, broader there, than the seven. Any, the seven that were identified by the school district uh, list are those that are in the Cal ALJ decision, because somehow he found them violative of the statute. We don't know why, because he doesn't tell us. Well, let's ask Superintendent uh, John Hoopenthal. Well, there's, those books were not, there's no, nothing about my order that requires that those books be banned at all. I, you know, um, I've read those books myself to familiarize myself with the issues at hand, but what we have concerns about are how those books are being used. You could use Mein Kampf in the classroom, but you'd have to be really careful, because you, if you found a teacher who wasn't using it to explore the issues in Mein Kampf critically, 
but you were, they were using it as a Bible, boy, that would be intolerable. And that's where the teachers have crossed over the line. They've gone from using these books critically to get to the students thinking about them from many vantage points to using these books essentially as a Bible. So and that is example, where they crossed over the line. That's the bright line. So, for example, you know, Shakespeare's—let bright, bright me line. ask you something just one second. For example, Shakespeare's The Tempest. What is well, your concern, uh, Superintendent Hoopenthal? Why has that uh, book been packed away? That was an irresponsible journalist who knew that he could say something false about something that happened. Uh, the, the Tempest hasn't been banned or put on any list. Or well, packed it, away. Me, that's just not true. The Tempest was told by the, by the, the teachers who teach Latino literature that they could not use the Tempest. That was in a recorded conversation. And to say again that that's, that was, you know, that's a false statement. It's a complete falsehood, Superintendent Hopenthal. You keep making accusations about facts that you just, that you know are not true. Let me assure you, and we fact, nobody would fact, ban the Tempest. Tempest. Well, but but let me ask you, um, Rethinking Columbus, The Next 500 Years, by Bill Bigelow, Chicano, The History of the Mexican Civil Rights Movement, by Arturo Rosales, um, Critical I, Race I Theory. No, I have no uh, problem with any of those books being in the classroom. Where you get, where you have a challenge, though, is if you bring a book like that in, again, we'll go for referencing back to Mein Kampf. If you're going to bring Mein Kampf into the classroom, you better be really careful about how you use it, because there's the bright line is going from using it to teach a student to think critically about that vantage point to th having the student use it as a Bible and a, and, a, and a creation of values. And that's where we found replete in all of the lesson plans over and over again. We found very inappropriate behavior by teachers where so they were a book crossing like over the line from him. thinking you critically. Know, you know, this notion of, of, uh, of inappropriate behavior by teachers, they can't cite to a single instance of that occurring. It's not in Mr. Hoopenthal's finding. It's not in the ALJ's finding. And, in fact, Mr. Hoopenthal can today cannot identify a single teacher on a single date in a single classroom who acted inappropriately. They've never done it, and he could not do it today. Uh, well, and with super, uh, Superintendent Hoopenthal giving us an example of inappropriate behavior on the part of a teacher. Well, well I mean, teacher, right, and, and right, well, right, well, right while I was in the class, the characterization of Benjamin Franklin as a racist without giving any other kind of viewpoint of him. And simultaneously, while you have Che Guevara putting you have Che Guevara putting people to death for expressing First Amendment so, rights, so you're, you're while you have Benjamin Franklin, who yet. perhaps more than Do any you know other founding father, he, created the First Amendment. So, I mean, so, for them to have that, so, for them so to walk out there thinking that Che Guevara is a hero so, and Benjamin so Franklin is a racist, it's so, a distortion so of history. Example is that if there was a poster up of Che Guevara, because he was not discussed in the class that you attended, you took offense to the poster, but you would not take offense to the poster of uh, any figure, uh, Adolf Hitler, uh, any other figure, historical figure, who's in the classroom. Yeah, and yet, oh, I and would yet, take offense yet, if, if well, Adolf Hitler was hold a poster again, up in a classroom. Again, Mr. We're going to have to end this right in 30 seconds. You know, how they were being talked about. Yeah, because Che Guevara wasn't talked about. So the only thing you can point to is you don't like the reference to Benjamin Franklin, who was a slaveholder. The reference was made to the fact that he was a slaveholder, and the contradictions that that presented. There's no problem with that. Same, no problem with same, making that reference same, at all. It's the same contradiction that exists in the, in, in the Constitution at its inception, that, you know, we don't treat African Americans as full citizens. They don't count. They can't vote. It's the same kind of problem that exists with, the, with what happens with the right for suffrage for women. You know, our history has been that it, from inequality, we have struggled to find equality, and that that struggle is taught in Mexican-American studies is not a bad thing. In fact, it's a very good thing. We're going to have to and leave it there. Richard Martinez, we thank you so much for being with us, attorney representing teachers and students of the Mexican-American Studies Association, and uh, Tucson Superintendent of Instruction, John Hoopenthal, uh, joining us um, from Washington, D.C. He's Arizona's Superintendent of Public Instruction. Uh, he ruled that the Tucson Ethnic Studies program violates state law and has suspended it as of this date.
This is Democracy Now! We'll certainly continue to follow this controversy as it travels through the courts. Uh, but when we come back, we're going to look at the war in Afghanistan. Please stay with us.